And the doctor had to come in and he said, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you have cancer um, and it's throughout your whole body, you know, and you would have six to eight weeks to live. And then I remember just crying and going, did I do something wrong? Did I cause this on myself? Well, my name is Tatiana Watley. I am an artist in like different uh, variations. I do photography. I like to draw, paint. Uh, I did glass art for a while. I specialized in sandblasting, but I did do some stained glass. Um, and like my hobbies, I love music, watching TV. <laughs> That's one of my new hobbies, uh, movies. Um, mermaids. I love mermaids. I have a mermaid tail that I actually swim in and um, being with my family and friends. I love that. Like I like to stay very busy with like artsy craftsy kind of things. I actually got my symptoms pretty quickly um, between like diagnosis. I would say within the year. Um, so I would say the January before I was diagnosed, so 2020, I was starting to have bone pain in my ribs and I developed this uh, mass right here in between my breasts. And um, I started to get like all of these, um, what I thought were like tight muscles or like little knots in my back. Um, and it was very painful stopped eating so much because it was hard to eat. Um, I was having issues breathing, but I was also overweight. I was 306 pounds. So I thought maybe all of this had to do with being overweight. And when I went into the doctors for all these issues, they said, lose weight and it will help. And that was kind of the answer that I got. And then it was, oh, well, you already have PCOS, so maybe that has something to do with it. Or you have insulin resistance, that could have something to do with it. Or um, I also had like um, uh, other like hormone imbalances, maybe that has something to do with it. But then it always came back to lose weight and it'll go away. No, I didn't think they were doing enough tests and I thought there was something else because it didn't make any sense. None of it made sense. Like how does this have to do with being overweight? And um, it was very frustrating, but it felt like I couldn't really get any other resolutions from this. And it was frustrating. And my whole life, if anything was wrong with me, it was you need to lose weight. That was the answer I always got. So I was used to it. I'm used to doctors not listening to me. And then it turned into with the ones on my neck because they were so big that, oh, there are cysts that need to be drained. And that's actually why I went into the ER because I was messaging my doctor on the 18th and I was saying, they hurt so bad, I can't handle this pain anymore, what can I do? And he said, just go to the ER, it is a cyst that needs to be drained. And, and it was like, nope, that's not what it was. And then finally, um, it's actually kind of interesting on the, 17th of February, my best friend stayed the night at my house and we were celebrating our Christmas together. So then the 18th, I went into the ER because I was in so much pain, I couldn't handle it. And then the 19th, I was diagnosed. <laughs> so it all happened very fast. Being in the ER that night was very traumatic because it was during COVID. 
So I was in the ER by myself. They started running all these other tests on me because they have to, you know, mandatory ER stuff. And then they, you know, they did a scan to see, okay, like, where does it have to be drained and all that stuff. And um, then they saw the masses. And I believe they saw this and then the mass in my chest. And it was so large. It was as if I was wearing a sports bra. And it ended up collapsing my right lung. And it was surrounding my heart and crushing it. When I was diagnosed, they gave me six to eight weeks to live. And I was like, in the ER getting diagnosed with that alone. Like, it was so crazy. Um, well, actually, my mom was sitting in the parking lot. And then, like, maybe 10 minutes before they came in to tell me my diagnosis, I said, just go home. because It was already one in the morning. Just go home. I'll call you when it's time for me to come home. And by the time she got home, um... I was calling the house phone and the doctor had to come in and he said, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you have cancer. Um, and it's throughout your whole body, you know, and you would have six to eight weeks to live. And originally they said it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But then after doing more tests, they realized that it was um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, both B and T cell with other mutations. It was very sad to hear and very scary. And at first, like I remember trying to keep my composure. I was like, okay, how do we resolve this? How did this happen? And then he was telling me like, oh, it could be environmental, it could be genetic, you know, all this stuff. Like, is there a history of cancer in your family? And then I remember just crying and going, did I do something wrong? Did I cause this on myself? Like, it was the weirdest, went from, like, mature, okay, how can we do this, to then just crying, because there was no history of cancer in my family, and there still isn't on either side. So, it had to have been environmental. What they ended up doing is saying that we have to get you an oncologist, and we have to keep you here until we can do the next steps. So, they... That night, I spent the night in the ER. The next morning, they admitted me into the hospital for about two weeks. I couldn't see my family and friends in person, um, except for out the window of the room that I was sharing with someone. And um, I was on the third floor, so we'd look down, and they looked like little ants, you know. And I was trying to wave at them, but um, it, and then luckily, there was this one nurse that I was having such a tough time. And I was crying and she, um, it was actually the head, the person, the head of the, that floor, she came in to talk to me and I was having such a hard time. And she actually allowed my mom, if she like had her COVID vaccinations, you know, she took a COVID test beforehand, wore a mask, all that stuff allowed her to come in. It was the first time I saw, saw her, you know, since going into the ER and I just cried and hugged my mom because that was all I wanted to do was like, all I want to do is hug my mom because it was such a scary moment. And I will forever be so grateful to this woman because for her to let me do that was like the best thing ever. I got my oncologist and um, so I was then released from the hospital for about four days just enough time to pack. And then um, uh, in March, I started my stay where I, it was a six, six step kind of plan. I don't remember what it was called, but the first step was me being in the hospital, getting different types of chemos, kind of like round the clock in a way. I got um, spinal tap chemo, chemo through the veins. I did radiation as well. Um, and uh, then I did that for the whole month. And then we checked my body with a PET scan. And I was actually in remission. It was so exciting. So then they started step two. Because the whole point was you finish step one. If you're in remission, then you start step two. We started step two. Halfway through my body, the mutations figured out the treatment plan. 
and mutated itself to fight against the cancer or to fight against the treatment. So I was no longer in remission. Because of that, we couldn't finish the six step plan. Um, then from there, they luckily, my oncologist was talking to Stanford and they had a double CAR T cell therapy trial going on. And I said, I was willing to do it. I said, yes, I will do anything. Um, and I know that it was a trial, but knowing that me going through this, it could possibly cure me, but also it could help other people in the end. That was super important to me because my whole life, I just want to help people. Um, so we went to Stanford, uh, did a double CAR T cell therapy. Um, I did it in, uh, June. Yeah. Um, and it was fantastic. And um, well, there was a lot of paperwork because it was, are you willing for this, this, um, you know, here are your side effects and they give you all of the potential possibilities. And then you do have to get put on, at least in this case, I had to do like a special diet. What was nice is they explained it to me as simple as they possibly could of how the process worked. So that was nice. So for the way that, and then they drew some of this stuff out, which was also really nice. The double card T, what they did was uh, two weeks before I went into the hospital for the double card T cell therapy was I went in as an outpatient and they took the CAR T cells out of my arm. And um, it was a very easy process. It was just like giving blood or platelets if you've ever done that. They just take the CAR T out and then put the remaining blood back into your body. Then what they did was they kind of, um, with the CAR T cells in the next couple of weeks, they mesh with them to make them like little ninjas in your body. And then you get put impatient. And when they put them back in your body, when they put the CAR T cells back in my body, it was just like getting any other, you know, um, in infusion. And um, they put it back in your body and then you kind of just hang out and see what happens. It was super simple though. Um, and they just watch you. They do neurological tests every day where they ask you 10 questions to, and you have to write um, like your name every day as well to like see where you are, to see if you're gonna have a neurological issue. And um, they watch for other side effects as well. But for the most part, it's just easy and you meet the nice nurses and yeah. Uh, I did actually have neurological problems through it. I mean, there were side effects, you know, you go chemo and everything, but um, I think the process in general is very easy and it was very interesting to learn. And, um, and then um, that put me in remission for a little while. Then I wasn't in remission again because of my body. Uh, the cells that they were actually attacking were C19 and C21. Um, those were the two that they were attacking. And yes, I was in remission. Um, but then again, the, my body figured out the treatment plan and changed itself to then attack the CAR T. So then the cancer began, began, began to grow back. And um, then... We tried a bone marrow transplant. So they knocked everything out of my body. So I was in Stanford for about, at that point, four or five months already for the double CAR T. And then I was in there for another five to six months for the bone marrow transplant. For me, I think it was only like maybe a month or two. It might not have even been that long because um, so I got my double CAR T cell the um, June 11th and then I got my bone marrow transplant um, August 8th or August 27th. So it wasn't it wasn't that long in between, you know, and um, so the bone marrow transplant was very um interesting so they were looking for they already knew i want that i needed a bone marrow transplant prior to the double car t 
Um, they just thought that they would get a little bit longer before, you know, they can give it to me, but it really wasn't that long. Um, so what happened was, um, they were doing the be the match. They were pairing with be the match to find a match for me. And I ended up getting one that was like the perfect 10 out of 10 match. And they were a year younger than me, but that was all I knew. And, um, and then I went into the hospital. So I went into the hospital. I did four days of radiation twice a, twice a day. Um, and it was full body, but also like localized to like the lung area and sternum area. And I did that uh, four times for twice, a, twice a day, four times. Uh, and then I also did like heavy duty chemo and I did that for about four days too, maybe even like five days. And then, um, then they gave me the transplant or the, the bone marrow, which was the big bag. It was the big bag. And by the way, my donor went above and beyond to be able to be my donor. So they gave me the bone marrow. And that was a, a three hour process, I believe. Yeah, it took them about three hours to get it all into my system. And then, um, yeah, and then I just kind of hung out in the hospital. As the side effects started, um, you know, they would give me like for nausea, give me medication for that um, and other side effects. I did get really bad mucus. So this is why I say this was the hardest one. Chewing on ice helped me a lot. Ginger ale. Um, I, let's see. Oh, they, there was something called magic rinse that helped with my throat and my mouth. Um, I would just swish that and swallow it. And it numbed it enough so that I wouldn't have the pain for a while. So that was nice. You know, but when I first got diagnosed, I was so worried about annoying the doctors that I didn't want to tell them if I had a side effect. So like, I was like, Oh, I'm okay. I'm fine. And put a smile on my face. And that wasn't the case. And like realizing that you are a team with your doctors, they are not working for you. You are not working for them. You're a team. And that's just how it is. And how is your team going to run? Well, if you're not honest with each other, and you kind of have to lose that filter. <laughs> like you're gonna have to tell them everything. You're gonna have to show them your whole body and that's okay. And again, it is your life. So to advocate for yourself is the most important thing that you could do. I got to go home like a week before Christmas of um, after my bone marrow transplant and um, I was not in remission at that point, but it was low enough that they could deal with it. And then after that, I was put onto an experimental chemo. Uh, chemo. Um, and it's called Navidoclax. And then, but it was paired with Venetoclax, which is a, a normal um, chemo. And I was on that for seven months and I did really good. And what was interesting too about my bone marrow transplant going back was they, with a bone marrow transplant, you get graft versus host disease. Um, and to treat graft versus host disease, they give you steroids. Well, they did that and immunosuppressants. They did that for me. They figured out that my cancer feeds off of those. So I was in remission and then I wasn't because the um, steroids and the immunosuppressants caused my cancer to grow. And then my body figured it out. And now I'm on this, this blimpsido treatment, which I, I'm on my two week break right now. So that's why I'm not attached. So after this, these two weeks, then I get uh, put into the hospital for two days and I start my next, my round two, um, on the day that I get admitted and I'm just watched for two weeks. Uh, observation and then I get sent home for the remaining um, four weeks of the treatment and then um, 
going into the infusion center every week to get my bags changed. And then, um, and then, you know, get removed the two, for the two week break and all of this at home and then back in the hospital for round three and yeah. And they want to do this for as long as my body will allow it basically. Well, for me, one of the things that has helped me, as I said before, is knowing that doing these clinical trials can help me. But even if it doesn't help me, that I'm helping scientists, I'm helping future patients, I'm helping current patients, I'm helping the doctors just learn more, but also um, could potentially be putting these treatments on the map for the future. And that to me is fantastic. Um, and in these trials, you end up meeting some pretty great people in treatment in general. You meet some pretty great people. And I've become friends with uh, people that have gone through the trials after me. And like my Stanford doctor said, hey, they're gonna do this, this treatment. They've never done it before. Can you talk to them? And I've made some of the bestest friends that I've had that understand what I'm going through and I understand what they went through, um, through this. So, it's been a really great cancer sucks but i there's been so much good and positivity that have come from it and being a part of these trials meeting these people and knowing that i'm helping has been one of the biggest positive things that have come from it for me